Blessed be the name of the Lord. What's that? Let's sing it. You want to sing it? What page did you say it was? 116. Oh boy. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise him through who all blessings flow. Amen. Praise the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He, he gives and takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He's a giver, but sometimes he takes things. But it's blessed be the name of the Lord. No matter what. Well, praise the Lord tonight. Let's. Uh, I want to read just a, just real quick and talk just a little bit in, in James tonight. And I love this book. And uh, Lord willing, I I I, I feel uh, the leading. Lord willing, and we'll we'll just follow the voice of God to to trek through this this wonderful book over the next however many weeks. Um, but tonight, I just kind of wanted to give a, a an overview of the book of James tonight. And um, I don't know, for some reason I feel like it's ringing, I, th I think it's because of the, probably the pulpit mic is still on. Do you, know how to mute, do you know how to mute the pulpit mic? Okay. It rings because it bounces back and it, it, it just, they love each other, the pulpit mic and this lapel mic. Um, but anyways, I don't hear it now, do you? All right. Thank you. Thank you, Crystal. <laughs> um. Well, James, so let's, let's talk real quick. I, I, I'm going to read, um, I, I got several scriptures to, to um, reference, but simply, James 1.1. 1, 1. Let's just start there. We're going to read it all? No, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to read it all. James 1.1 1, 1 simply says this. 
James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Greeting. In other words, he's saying, howdy. Right? Hello. He's greeting them. Now, from this one verse, the introductory verse, the, the, the dear whoever, the, 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 it sets the stage. Who is the, the, the person writing? James. Well, we gather that. That's easy. The Lord Jesus Christ. Who is he writing to? The Jewish tribes. Scattered abroad. Who is the Jewish tribes? Jews. He's writing to the, the Jews. See, James is, is calling or his, his mission. See, God lays a, a, an individual specific calling on all of our lives doesn't he? We cannot possibly personally reach every single person. And neither, and that sh- that's not our job to try to reach every... Now, some God has blessed some people with a platform, say like people like Billy Graham and other people who have spoke to thousands, if not millions, and have had that kind of a platform. Sometimes God gives a platform maybe to a maybe to a, someone famous. And I'll tell you what, the bigger the platform that God gives us, the more responsibility we have, don't we? So uh, just remember that. But God gives, and so God gives James uh, the, the, the yearning to reach out to his fellow Jewish people. And who he wants to reach out to is those that have converted to Christianity, right? But they are being persecuted. We gather that they are scattered abroad, all right? Uh, that they are, they're dispersed, right? They're not living all in Jerusalem. They're not living all in one place. It's not organized because, hey, Christianity was being persecuted, especially Jews that would convert to Christianity. That didn't make the fellow Pharisees very happy, did it? Didn't make the Sanhedrin very happy. And they were being persecuted. And James, his, his desire and his mission is to reach these people and to, to, to pour out to these people by whatever means necessary. And so he writes them, oh, would God lay on our heart the burden for people? Would God lay on our heart the burden, yes, for the lost, but for our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ? Amen. Those that are hurting, those that are in need, Would God lay those people in our heart? Well, James here is um, sometimes known as James the Just. This is not the disciple James, the son of Zebedee, the brother of John the disciple. It's a different James. This is James, the brother of Jesus, is what the scripture tells us. Um, Some, including uh, the Roman Catholics, say that James was only a cousin or a stepbrother, maybe, of Jesus. Um, well, if you want to look in Galatians 1.9, it's called, this is the Lord's brother. Well, now, yeah, I could see that. A, the brother here is like, well, we, it's kind of the same way in which we call brother. It's like, what's, hey, brother. Well, he's not my biological brother, but I call him my brother. So you, you could see maybe where they're coming from. But if you go to the Gospels, if you go to Matthew 13 or Mark 6, uh, um, and all the Gospels support this. It names James as one of Jesus' siblings. So it really tells me, I look at this and I see it's being more specific here. So I gather that, that James was a brother of Jesus. I gather that. I think that. And it works out for what I'm going to say briefly next. Je- Jesus' brothers, while he was alive, his siblings did not believe in Jesus as the Messiah. Can you imagine your older sibling claiming to be God? Talk about sibling rivalry. Now Mary and Joseph knew what they saw. They knew that they knew Jesus. They knew their son Jesus. Talk about, now I'm not saying they played favorites, but talking about, think about what, if you had a lot of brothers, if you grew up in a big family, and you had a brother that, that was the special one, and the sibling rivalry, could you imagine what that would have been like? 
Jesus. My brother is not the creator of the universe. He can't be. <laughs> He's just a carpenter. <laughs> he grew up the same as me. And But we see that James, being one of those, does at some point believe later. And James, it's so interesting that James, who was, didn't accept Jesus as the Messiah on earth, but yet, according to church history, then later died because he wouldn't refuse who Jesus was. Isn't that amazing what God can do in your life? Think about the irony of that. James, who did not accept Jesus, later ends up dying because he wouldn't deny Jesus. It's stoned. And then uh, church history has it that he was stoned and it did, he didn't get killed, so then someone came up to him and bashed him in the head with a big club, according to different parts of Jewish history. Whatever, whatever however he died, he was, he was killed because he would not deny Jesus. Now, we have it pretty good here, don't we? Or do we? But we have it good. We have never been persecuted to the point of death for our faith. Hey, we might get laughed at. We might be the joke of, of some people. Or, you know, we might feel left out because of that sometimes. And especially not so much probably now, but maybe when we were younger. Or, you know, I know kids some. It have it sometimes hard growing up and to be the, the Christian kid. And, and um, you know, I, I, it's hard, but we have never been to that point. But there is that in the world today. But James knew exactly what this was about. James knew firsthandedly what persecution was about. And so this kind of leads into what is James, the book of James, about? Well, James is about faith. About faith, um, true faith, true faith. He's writing to people who have lost their homes, these first century Jewish Christians residing in the Gentile communities. He's writing to people that are being persecuted he knew what being persecuted was, was about. He would later pay the, the greatest penalty, death, for, for believing. And where these people are ending up, they're, they're still running into all sorts of problems. We see his mission field, as I said, the, like the, the persecuted Jewish Christians who, once, who were once part of the Jerusalem church because James became one of the greatest People, one of the greatest leaders in the Jerusalem church. James is full of practical wisdom and, not, and instruction. Sometimes James is referred to as the proverb of the New Testament. This could be considered a, a how-to book for Christian living. If we want to know how to live as a Christian, James is a great book to, to refer to. It says that a relationship with Jesus should, have, should affect our behavior. Amen? That it's not just about word, but there's a need to live a godly life. James tells us in, here in the first chapter, verse 22 and 25, to not just be hearers of the word. There's a lot of hearers of the word, isn't there? Hey, there's a lot of hearers that might even be here. Everybody that's here on a Sunday, everybody that comes to church is a hearer. If they're here either that or, or so, of some sort. But it says don't just be hearers, but be doers of the word. And this thought, you can see this thought continuing into chapter 2, starting at verse 14, when the famous, what James is famous for is many people think about James and, and we, the first thing we think about is faith without works is dead. A lot of people, and that is in there in chapter 2, and, and we'll, Lord willing, we'll look at that, but it's kind of the same principle. Don't be hearers. Don't just have, you, don't just have faith. Don't just know who God is. Satan knows who God is. Satan hears the word of God. But be doers of the word. Put it into action. Faith without works is dead. That's not saying work saves you. But if, if, if the, it's not that we have to do to obtain faith and have to be saved. But it's that the, the spirit of God inside of us as Christians will compel us to do. 
Does that, does that make sense? It's not that we do to gain acceptance. It's that with having the Spirit inside, it will compel us to do. It's the centrifugal force of the Holy Spirit. We know what centrifugal force is, right? You ever been on merry-go-round? You've been spun around real fast? Well, that centrifugal force pushes you outward, right? And the Spirit of God inside of us will push us, push us outward into the world to do good, to draw people. To, to, to the Spirit draws, but to tell people about Jesus, to plant the seeds. Amen? Praise the Lord. James wrote, One reason to expose hypocritical practices and to teach right Christian behavior. Chapter 2 talks about partiality of any kind being a sin. See, we talk about... I'm going to get into it too much, but this is partiality of any kind, whether we call it racial partiality, partiality of, of the rich and, or poor or whatever. It's the same concept, same word in a respecter of persons, right? God is not a respecter of persons. God doesn't care where you came from. He doesn't care what color of skin you have. He doesn't care where you're from. He doesn't care how old you are, how young you are. God loves and offers His grace and mercy to all who believe. Amen? That's good news. He doesn't just offer it to the people that have a lot of money. Thank the Lord. He doesn't just offer it to us Americans. Praise the Lord. He offers it to all. And partiality is judging judgment from a human perspective based off of anything but what's in the heart. God looks at the heart, doesn't he? Now, we can't see the heart. We don't know what the heart is. But the Bible says, Jesus says, by their fruits you'll know them. So the heart, what's in the heart, once, once again, going to the same cycle, that it's the centrifugal force of the Holy Spirit that without works, faith without works is dead. Amen? He talks about uh, the trials they're going through, and, and, and James surely knew what trials were about. And this is the, 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 it just, James just starts out just, I call it hardcore. It just starts out bang. Uh, my brethren, count it, I'm going to go ahead and read verse 2. It just, it just goes big. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into a diverse temptation. Well, we don't think of that a lot as joy, and I'm not going to try to get into this too much tonight. But I feel, I feel this verse, and I, I, I feel let. We don't, we don't think that, naturally. When things happen, when we fall into temptations or trials and tribulations, the first thing we think is, oh, we're not, it, it's not real joyful. But, but it's interesting, it, interesting that Jane says, count it all joy that when we go through this, that the trials we go through, the trials James is telling these scattered Jewish Christians that the trials that you're going through, they're not a waste. It's not a waste of time. These trials are not a coincidence. I don't believe in coincidences with God, do you? But this is something that God wants to use in your life. And so often we don't think about that. Many times we, in the Christian life, we would think, here's what we, it, it, the Mets, oh, follow Jesus and he'll make everything wonderful. He'll make your heart wonderful. He'll make your perspective wonderful. He'll give you peace that passes all understanding. But we're going to fall. We are going to. It's not a matter of if. We are going to. And as Jim said, the moment that he got saved is when he realized there was a, an enemy. We're going to fall into temptations and trials. They're going to come across us. But the Bible says, first of all, you know why we count it joy? Well, think about it this way. If Satan wasn't trying to fight, he wouldn't have anything to take. He's fighting us because he doesn't want us to have the joy of the Lord. Amen? He doesn't want us to be saved. But count it joy... Because Satan's against us. If Satan wasn't trying to find us, we ought to be scared about it. If he wasn't trying to, to, to tempt us, then we ought to say, well, that's scary. I ought to look at it like that. It, it, 
some uh, messages, or he'll take away all your pain, or he'll make you rich if you follow the Lord. But folks, count it joy when we fall into diverse temptations. Is what God wants to do, what God wants to do, is to not make people happy, but to make people holy. And that's what trials and temptations do when God conquers them in your life. When we surrender them to God, we don't conquer them, but God conquers them through us. Amen? Yield ourselves to Him. It draws us closer, and it continues to make us more and more into the image of God. Remember Romans 8, 28 says, All things happen for the good of those who love God and the ones called according to His purpose. All things happen. The, the good there is not the good that many times that people like to think of. It's not the good to make everything all, all uh, roses and, and bliss. But the good in that is to make us, as it says in Romans, in the context of Romans, to make us, to conform us into the image of Jesus Christ. That's the good. That's the goal in our life. The goal in every one of our lives is to be made continually into the image of of Jesus Christ. That's the goal. But we fall into things. We fall into trials. We fall into trials. Say, Lord, how are you going to use this in my life? I don't see how, but Lord, how will you use this in my life? What are you doing, Lord? What are you doing in my life? Draw me closer to you. When we're truly pursuing the things of God, following the Spirit into action, it makes resisting temptation easier. It makes facing trials and difficulties easier. It becomes about a deep relationship with God, knowing Him, where everything in our life revolves around Him. Everything in our life revolves around our relationship with God and God. It's not easy to do, but it's worth doing. So I want to leave you with this thought tonight, and I'll close. Do we have, as we think about it, as we start to dig into James, and we'll follow God and, and, and whatever he leads, do we have this type of faith? My prayer tonight is this, for me, and really all of us tonight, is, Lord, give me the wisdom I need to navigate through this life in a way that honors you. Give me the wisdom I need. The wisdom I need. Give me the wisdom. Solomon asked for wisdom. God gave him wisdom. Now, he didn't handle that wisdom the best. It, give me the wisdom I need to navigate through this life in a way that honors you. It's not necessary, Lord, Help me to understand exactly what you're doing every single moment because we don't understand all, all the times the ways of God, but understand that he knows best and that we yield ourselves in his arms and his hands and, 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 and trust him, trust him. It'll be worth it. Well, let's pray tonight. Does anybody have anything tonight before we go to prayer together? Let's go to prayer together tonight. Lord Jesus, thank you uh, for your presence, Holy Spirit, and thank you uh, for your love, Lord. I thank you that on a Wednesday night you would show up and you'd be in the midst, Lord. And Lord, we just continue to seek you, Lord, continue to lay ourselves down for you, Lord Jesus, that you would have your way. Lord, I know you have great plans, God. I pray that we would just draw closer and closer to you every day, Lord. Give us the wisdom that we need to navigate through this life in a way that honors you. Let all we do honor you. Let all we do glorify you, Lord Jesus. Pray these things in your holy name. Amen. Amen.